Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Okay, let's begin with, with prayer. Father, thank you for celebrating the, today the resurrection of Jesus. Thank you that your plan all along included his death on our behalf. That he willingly sacrificed himself to provide us salvation, provide you with a legal way to to justify us, a legal, legal way to to impute his righteousness to our account and to forgive us. Thank you for that. Thank you for the symbolism of of the resurrection. Thank you that salvation was paid by the cross and eternal life was guaranteed by coming out of the grave. Thank you. As we continue to study this morning racism in a biblical response to it, we trust that you would be honored by that as we look at your word, as we consider um, how we can can talk to folks around us about this very subject. Thank you. Give us a great time in, uh, in the service uh, to follow, that you would be honored always. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, we're in lesson number five of One Race, One Blood. This is a diversity of humanity. Much of what we're covering today will be a kind of a rehash, but telling it a different way of uh, what we have seen in the discussion um, so far. Our uh, focus this morning is a diversity, or diversity is an intentional part of God's original design. This is a, I love the way that they phrase that. It's an intentional part of God's design. God always meant it to be this way. Our objectives this morning as a result of this lesson, uh, we should be able to illustrate genetic variation in offspring. We should be able to, 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 to talk sort of intelligently about why there are variations, why you have long-haired cats and short-haired cats, and why you have blonde-haired, blue-eyed, light-skinned people and uh, dark-skinned people and, and so forth. How we could all be the same race. Illustrate genetic variation in offspring. Contrast the biblical understanding of diversity with that of the world. It's an interesting topic. And maybe we, we won't cover that topic as in-depth in as it might sound like we would. Um, it's pretty politically charged. Explain the role of genetics in human diversity. So, here are the things to uh, look for as we go into the video. Where did Cain get his wife? We should all be able to answer that question now before we even get to that. Get to that. But I'm, I'm amazed at the number of Christians that can't answer that properly. Just blows my mind. How do we explain diversity? If somebody came up to you on the street today, how would you explain diversity? Adaptation and speciation. Not the same thing as evolution. We all have adapted. Because when it got down to 50 degrees, we were all shivering. And all of us lived up north where it got down to 50 degrees on a summer day. So, Oh, I'm sorry. Kate, Kate, Kate is the only, only Florida native here. Uh, well, but she's not in here. What shade was Adam and Eve's skin? I like to refer to their skin color as pecan tan. That's my favorite definition of Adam and Eve's skin. That's middle brown, as they say it, answers in Genesis. And again, the main point is diversity is an intentional part of God's original 
design. Okay, let's go into, uh, into the video and then we can have questions afterwards. Thank you, everyone. Uh, the topic that I'm gonna discuss is one race, many nations after Babel. For instance, there are many people today who are confused about the origin of the so-called races of people on the earth. Uh, they base their misconceptions on what they have been taught about the idea that people evolved from ape-like creatures, that some people are more evolved uh, than others. However, the Bible teaches us something different, that we are all descendants of one set of parents, Adam and Eve, and that all the people in the world today, cultures, people groups, can be explained through the events that took place at the Tower of Babel in the history of Genesis chapter 11. So this presentation is gonna show you the origin of people groups. It is gonna show you where Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel and they had their wives. And uh, we're gonna answer some very important questions for you in this presentation. So whenever we're talking about the issue of race and people, one of the most often asked questions here at our ministry and around churches around the world is this, where did Cain get his wife? Because we know that God created Adam and Eve and we know that they had two boys, Cain and Abel, and we know that Cain killed Abel and then they had Seth, but the question is, where did Cain get his wife? And before I answer this question for you, I'm going to ask you a few questions of my own. And here's the quiz for you. You didn't know you were gonna take a quiz this afternoon, but here we go. The question is this, can you marry your relation? And here are the options that I'm gonna to give to you. Yes, no, probably, or only after counseling, right? Now, there are many people that say that you are not allowed to marry your relative. I have news for you. If you don't marry your relative, then you are not marrying another human being, and then you have an even bigger problem. Because if we all go back to Adam and Eve, as the Bible says, then it means that we are all related to one another. Jesus Christ steps into history. Jesus becomes a descendant of Adam to die for the descendants of Adam. So he becomes our relative and he takes upon himself Adam's sin uh, so that he can redeem us from the curse of Adam's sin. Matter of fact, the Bible begins by telling us in uh, Jesus' genealogy, the son of Adam, the son of God. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 45 says, and so it is written, the first man Adam became a living being the last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So the Bible is very clear that at the very beginning, there is one man by the name of Adam. But Genesis chapter three, verse 20 also tells us that Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So scripture is very clear that at the very beginning, God made Adam and Eve male and female. And I'll explain why this is significant. Matter of fact, the apostle Paul in uh, Acts chapter 17 says this, and he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. The apostle Paul is saying that all people can trace themselves back to Adam and Eve. Now, we go back to this question, where did Cain get his wife? And the problem is many people don't read a little bit further and the Bible gives us an answer for this. So Genesis chapter five, verse four says this, after he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years and he had sons and daughters. Now, some terminology is very important when I'm sharing this with all of us here today. If marriage is between one man and one woman, then there's a word that we need to latch onto and the word is originally. Originally, brothers could marry sisters. Now, it is true that we don't marry a close relative today, but we read even in the Bible that Abraham was married to his half-sister and that was not a problem. It wasn't until the time of Moses that God prohibited close relations from marrying one another. In Leviticus chapter 18, verse six, it says, none of you shall approach anyone who is near of kin to him to uncover his nakedness. I am the Lord. Why is it that God prohibits close relations from marrying one another at the time of Moses and not a little bit earlier? Well, let's look at it from a big picture perspective and let's look at genetics to help us understand why God would prohibit this. For instance, you would know at the very beginning, God originally created Adam and Eve and they were perfect. Matter of fact, Genesis chapter one, verse 31 says that God, when God had created everything, he looked upon his creation and he said that it was very good. So a perfect creation reflects the perfect character of God. But in Genesis chapter two, God also warned Adam that if he was to disobey him, he would surely die. There would be physical and spiritual consequences to Adam's disobedience. 
And we know about what happens that Adam ends up sinning. And as a result of Adam's sin, we all end up dying because we are all descendants of Adam and Eve. The sustaining powers in the universe also begin to die, including our own bodies. So now we have sin and curse when prior we had perfection. Because now we live in a fallen world and we are no longer perfect, mistakes and mutations increase from one generation to another. So after 6,000 years, we have a lot of mistakes and it's called the genetic load. And they continue to increase over time. So if you are closely related to someone and you end up marrying them, you are going to share in the same mistakes when you have offspring. So that's why it is better to marry someone who is a further relation from you because many times the good genes will end up masking the bad genes. And we know again that at the time of Moses, God prohibits close relations from marrying one another. So originally, brothers could marry sisters. Cain married his sister. But that brings up another question. How do we explain the diversity of people all around the world? If we are saying that we all come from Adam and Eve, how do we explain skin shade, eye color, uh, hair color, uh, different languages? How can we explain this if God originally created Adam and Eve? We are going to use the history of Genesis and we're going to show why we can trace it all back to Adam and Eve based on the events of the Tower of Babel, Noah and his sons, and going back to Adam and Eve. So we're going to change some terminology. We're going to clear up some terminology and we're going to see this from a biblical perspective. Let's go to Genesis chapter one. About 10 total times we see a phrase that is used after his kind or after their kind. God, tells, God says that each kind is gonna reproduce after their own kind. Notice this is drastically different from the evolutionary models, the Darwinian tree, uh, that something comes from nothing and over time everything comes about by a process of evolution. But God's word is telling us that he created things to reproduce within their own kind. And this is more closely related in the classification system to the family uh, in that order and helping us understand what the kind actually means. Now, there are people who say that when the Bible mentions after their kind, it is saying that animals don't change. That is not what the Bible is saying. It is saying that each kind will reproduce after their own kind, but they will have different features and traits that can be traced back to the original source. Even Darwin himself observed that animals changed. For instance, here's a chart here that shows you the cat kind, the dog kind, and the elephant kind. Notice that when they have offspring, all of their offspring have different physical features and sizes and so on and so forth, but they can be traced back to the original cat kind, the dog kind, or the elephant kind. So for a purpose of illustration this afternoon, we're going to look at the dog kind. And many scientists agree that the origin of the domestic dog from wolves has been established, suggesting a common origin from a single gene pool for all dog populations, and that based on genetic, morphological, and behavioral data, it is clear that the domestic dog originates from the wolf. So when we look at our world today, we see many different species of dogs, and what these scientists are saying is that they can be traced back to an original dog kind, the wolf. So we have all of these different species, including these. These come from this, which reproduces this. Interesting, right? So people say, well, isn't this a proof of evolution? Doesn't this prove evolution? Uh, actually, it's not an uphill process. It is a downhill process. Because what you will notice is that as the dogs get smaller, you will notice that they are losing information when you come all the way down to the poodle when you think about the fact that there is no new information that is added. Now, notice how this is completely different than what evolution teaches because from what we see here, it is a new combination of already existing information. There is less variability, which is the opposite of evolution. Now, let's say God originally made a male and female kind and these dogs just kept on multiplying. Now you're going to have a lot of dogs. Now, not only are you gonna have lots of dogs, but these dogs are also gonna carry with them genetic information. So you have the capital letters that represent dominant genes and you have the uh, lowercase letters that represent recessive genes. 
So the male and female have capital letters and lowercase letters as part of their genetic makeup. And so when they have offspring, they're going to have different combinations of these letters in their offspring. There is a variation within the dog kind. Notice that this is not new information, it is a new combination of information. Uh, and so you will see that there are no letters D, E, and F because the information that is found in the offspring is already there in the original parent. So when God says that they will reproduce after their own kind, they will reproduce within their own family, that dogs are going to be dogs. Now, how do we explain this in terms of uh, Noah's flood and the dog kind going on Noah's ark. For instance, you know that when Noah and his family come off the ark, the animals also come off the ark. And then we have something called uh, confusion in the Tower of Babel where God spreads the people out all over the earth. And they would also, many of them take animals with them and the animals would also scatter all over the earth. So when these dogs scattered all over the earth, notice that they would also take with them the genetic information that was in them as they would spread out all over the earth. So what I'm gonna show, show you right now is how adaptation and speciation uh, takes place based on the genetic makeup and then these animals spreading out all over the earth. We'll keep it very simple here. For instance, you'll notice the male and female kind dog, uh, they have medium hair, but they have S which represents short hair and L which represents long hair. So they have medium hair and they will have offspring with short hair, medium hair, and long hair. Notice the offspring already have letters that are present in the parent. So let's look at how speciation and adaptation takes place. If all of these dogs decide to take a journey and they go to a very uh, cold climate, question for you, which dog do you think will survive in a very cold climate? It is the dog with capital letters L, correct? And the other dogs will end up dying. Why? Because they are not able to adapt to that environment. The fur on this dog is able to keep it warm. So you have this particular species of this dog kind that is preserved in that environment. Not only that, but if you were to take these dogs and you were to go to a very warm or hot climate, which dog do you think will survive? It is the dog that has capital letters S and the other dogs will survive because the fact that it does not have long hair and long fur is able to keep it cool even in the warmer temperatures. So now you have this particular species of dog that is preserved in this environment. So we have adaptation to an environment and we have species that are preserved in an environment. But what about when it comes to people? How do we explain the origin of the diversity of people that we see all around the world today? Well, the events of uh, Noah and the flood, and obviously when you come off the ark, uh, you have the people that begin to build a tower to make a name for themselves, and God comes down and he confuses the languages and he spreads them out all over the earth. So we're going to look at people from a historical perspective, starting in the book of Genesis, and we are going to look at the Tower of Babel to come to our answer regarding people and diversity. Now, again, it's important for us to understand that God created to reproduce after their own kind. Now, this is very important. If we all go back to Noah and his family, and Noah and his family go back to Adam and Eve, what does that mean? It means that there aren't many different races of people in the world today. It means that there is only one race, the human race, and that we are all related to one another. So what do we do with the word races? Here's what we do. We take the word races and we throw it in the trash can. And how do we describe people? Should we say, well, what race are you? No, we're not going to do that because, again, there's one race, the human race. We're going to describe people as being from different people groups and cultures all around the world, who can trace themselves back to Noah and his family and back to Adam and Eve. Look at even what some secular scientists say. They say this, that more and more scientists find that the differences that set us apart are cultural, not racial. Some even say that the word race should be abandoned because it's meaningless. The Human Genome Project, which was consisted of secular scientists that came together to study the human genome, they put together a draft of the entire sequence of the human genome, and the researchers unanimously declared that there is only one race, the human race. This is something we as Christians already knew. Why? Because we know that the word of God is true, beginning in the book of Genesis. 
Matter of fact, their research further went on to say that labels used to distinguish people by race have little or no biological meaning. So the secular scientists are already verifying what we know to be true in the word of God that all human beings can trace themselves back to Adam and Eve, that we are all related to one another. There is one race, the human race. But how can we explain the diversity of people that we see in our world today from a scientific perspective and how should we describe people? Should we say that people have different colors or should we say that they have the same color and different shades, right? Here's how I'm gonna illustrate this for you because we have been singing a particular song the wrong way. And it is a very famous children's song. You know the song, it goes like this, and I'm not gonna sing it for you because you'll leave this room. Um, the song goes, Jesus loves the little children of the world, red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight, right? How many of you are familiar with that song? Absolutely. But do you realize we've been singing this wrong because if we want to be accurate, not just scientifically, but biblically, we're gonna be singing this a little bit different. Why do I say that? Let me illustrate this for you. For instance, there is a brown pigment that every single human being has. It is called melanin. Every single one of us has this. Matter of fact, melanin not only determines skin shade, it determines eye color, it determines hair color, but we're gonna look at the color of the shade of our skin. So if you are someone who has a very dark shade as part of your genetic makeup, you have capital letters A and B. If you have a very light shade of skin, you have lowercase letters A and B. And if you have a middle brown shade, you have a combination of capital letters A and B and lowercase letters A and B. Notice that these are simply external features and they have nothing to do with your value. What's sad is that we live in a world today where people determine their value based on what they look like. The Bible is telling us that this is simply an external feature that has been given to us by God. So the reason we look the way we do is not a mistake. It is by purpose and design from a creator God. So if we have this information that there, we live in a world today where there are people with dark shade, people with very light shade, and then we have people in the middle that have a medium brown shade, the question that comes up is what shade, not color, was Adam and Eve's skin? Notice again, we change the terminology. We don't describe people by their color. We describe them by their skin shade because all people have a brown pigment in their skin called melanin. So let's change some of our vocabulary or clean it up and let's use the proper terminology. For instance, instead of saying that people have a certain color, let's use the word shade not color. Let's describe people as being different people groups and cultures all around the world, not races because there's only one race, the human race. Since we all have a brown pigment in our skin called melanin, we know that all people have color, not just some, and that if we can trace ourselves back to Noah and his family and then back to Adam and Eve, it means that we are related to everyone, not just our close family. The fact that we are related to everyone should make an impact on how we reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ. If you're walking down the street or if you know a person in your community that is hurting and destitute and is struggling in their spiritual walk, it is important for us to understand that they too are our relative in Adam and they need the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we think about what shade, not color, was Adam and Eve's skin, Let's look at it again from a scientific perspective. If Adam and Eve only had lowercase letters A and B as part of their genetic makeup, they would only have offspring with lowercase letters A and B. Notice the information that is found in the offspring exists already in the parents. If Adam and Eve only had capital letters A and B, they would have offspring with only capital letters A and B. But when we look at our world today, we know that there is a variety of diversity when we think about skin shade. When you think about this, it is lacking genetic variation. But when you think about it from a biblical perspective and you understand the diversity in the world today, it makes sense to us that Adam and Eve would have a combination of capital letters A and B as part of their genetic makeup. Matter of fact, if you were to go into Adam and Eve's home you would notice that you would have children with very dark shade, you would have medium brown shade going to light shade to very, very light shade. Imagine walking into Adam and Eve's home and finding these children and you would be asking, do these belong to you, right? 
But this is the variation and the diversity that God has placed, God had placed within Adam and Eve so they could have children, one from light shade to dark shade in just one generation. Pretty incredible, the diversity that God has placed inside of Adam and Eve, and we are able to verify it and see it in our world today. I wanna show you a quick video uh, that explains this even further, so you'll have to pay attention because this goes really fast. I hear this one a lot. How can there be so many races in the world if we are all descendants of Adam and Eve? Well, check this out. First off, let's talk about the word race. Sometimes when people use the word, they mean supposed races of people who have evolved at different times, rates, and in different locations. That's not true. Of course, the word race is also a term we use to distinguish between groups with different physical traits, namely skin color. But are there really different races? Take a gander at Acts 17.26, where it is written that God, from one man, made every nation of men. It's clear then that the Bible teaches that there is one race, the human race. The Bible is also clear that all people on the earth are descendants of Adam and Eve who were created by God. Check Genesis 1, 26 through 28. Easy enough. God created two people in his image, male and female, and told them to increase in number. So Adam and Eve are mom and dad of the human race. Then their children had children and those children had children and so on and so forth for many generations until, according to Genesis 6, 9, the world's population was reduced to eight people who were protected inside an ark during a global flood. And those eight people later walked off the ark and according to Genesis 9, 19, from them came the people who were scattered over the earth. Oh, wait a second. What do I mean scattered? Well, jump over to Genesis 11 and let's talk about an event known as the Tower of Babel. Basically, because of the sinful actions of the descendants of Noah, the Lord confused their language and scattered them from there over all the earth. That's pretty clear and concise. Okay, so we've got lots of people who are descendants of the eight folks who came off the ark, and now they have been scattered all over the earth. That explains that we are still one race and that different groups of people ended up in different locations. But how do we get a bunch of different colored people if we are all one race? Well, follow along. This, of course, is a simplified explanation, but the basic principles are true. We all have a pigment in our bodies called melanin, which, depending on different variables, produces different shades of the one main skin color we all possess. Several genes control the amount of melanin produced and thus the variability in the skin shade. In fact, it's easy for one couple to produce a wide range of skin shade variability in just one generation, as we'll see in just a moment. Time for a quick genetics lesson. DNA is the molecule of heredity that is passed from parents to children. A child inherits 23 chromosomes from each parent. Each chromosome pair contains hundreds of genes which regulate the physical development of the child. However, to illustrate basic genetic principles pertaining to the topic, we'll just talk about two genes, the genes that control the production of melanin. So, let capital A and capital B symbolize versions of the gene that code for large amounts of melanin, while little a and little b code for small amounts. Got it? Easy. Check this out. Take a look at the upper left. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B genes, and mom contributes capital A, capital B genes as well. Together, they will produce a child with capital A, capital A, capital B, and capital B. This is a kid with a lot of melanin, and thus he will have very dark skin. Easy to see. Here's the bigger point, though. Let's say dad contributes capital A, capital B, and mom contributes little a and little b. Well, the child's skin will be middle brown shade, the combination of capital A, little a, and capital B, little b, which, by the way, represents a majority of the world's population. Not only that, but if each parent is capital A, little a, capital B, little b, the combinations that could be produced in their children could result in a very wide range of skin shades in just one generation. So. Since Adam and Eve were the first people ever, it makes sense to conclude that God placed in them a combination of genes that could produce all different shades of skin we see. Those same combinations would be present in Noah and the seven other people who boarded the ark. And because God dispersed people at the Tower of Babel, he dispersed the population, thereby isolating gene pools in the different people groups. Over time, different cultures formed in different locations with certain features like skin shade becoming predominant. And here we are today. And since we all go back to Noah and his family, it makes sense that we are all different shades of brown. One race, multiple people groups, just like the Bible teaches. Simplified for sure, but enough said. Were you able to keep up with the video? Excellent. So when I was going back to this reference about how do we sing that song again, because we've always sung it, red and yellow, black and white, all our precious in his side. The next time you go to sing that song, you have to say brown and brown, brown and brown, right? You gotta, you gotta use brown every time, why? Because we all have a brown pigment in our skin called melanin. So this is going to be interesting the next time you lead children's ministry and you sing this song because you're going to be accurate scientifically and biblically. Let me give you again another illustration from a modern day example of the diversity that God has placed inside of our genes and when we see it manifested in the offspring. Here you have a picture of two parents. Both of these parents had one parent with a dark shade, one with a light shade. And you see the children that have a middle brown shade and these children got married and they had children and they had twin daughters. And you notice one has a dark shade and one has a light shade. 
The information that is there is already present in the parents. Here is a photo of them when they are a little bit older. So you can see the diversity can be explained based on the Tower of Babel and the fact that God has placed all the variability and the genetic information in Adam and Eve, and we see it in our world today, and it is also verified by science. Here's also a very alarming uh, thing when it comes to the variability that God has placed inside of our genes. For instance, these are the number of atoms in the known universe. Now, you would agree with me that this is a very large number. You would say to me, it would be great to have this much money in my bank account, right? That is a large number. But I want you to consider something. If you were to take a man and a woman in this room, do you know how many children you could potentially have without two having the same combination of information just based on the variability in your genes? I want you to think about how great God is and how diverse he has made you and the genetic makeup that God has placed within Adam and Eve. Are you ready for this number? Here's the number. It is the number 10 followed by 2,017 zeros. This is the variability that God has placed within our genes, that you could have a number of children, one man and one woman could have without two looking the same. That is incredible what God is able to do. So from a Darwinian perspective, we start from nothing, and over time we have evolution, people evolving from ape-like creatures. Uh, we have some people that are supposedly higher races than others. But when you think about the Bible, the Bible says that God made the kinds big pools of information, which is the exact opposite of evolution. So when we think about the aspect of race, we can look at the events of the Tower of Babel and the dispersion that took place because of the disobedience of human beings and that God comes down and scatters the people and they spread out all over the earth. And when the people end up scattering all over the earth, what they do is they end up carrying the genetic information with them as they go to different parts of the world. So again, when we look at the Bible, we can have an answer to explaining the diversity that is there around the world and the features that we have as part of our genetic makeup, God had already placed within Adam and Eve. Let me close by sharing this one last quote for you. It says this, it says, when the facts show, what the facts show is that there are differences among us, but they stem from culture, not race. And that is why we are called to go out into all the world and preach the gospel to everyone because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God and we all sinned in Adam and Eve and all of us are in need of a savior. Jesus Christ steps into history. He becomes a descendant of Adam to redeem the descendants of Adam. We truly can have answers when our thinking is based on the word of God. And that foundation starts in the book of Genesis with the Tower of Babel to help us understand the diversity of people all around the world. Thank you. Okay. Questions? Uh, the Tower of Babel is you know, after the ark. Mm -hmm. That was all the people in the world, that was the problem. Because the command was to be fruitful and to fill the earth. And uh, they all stayed together and didn't heed the command to populate the earth. So I, I think by, by the fact that God disciplined them for violating the command, we can conclude they were all, they were all there. Uh, there had not been, and we don't even see this in, in secular reasoning. When, when you, when you, he referred to the Human Genome Project, when you look at the data that they've produced, they've concluded, first they concluded that, that North Central Africa was where everybody came from. After some modification, after some additional research, they, they went north and east of there into, uh, into Iran, Iraq area somewhere and concluded that everybody came from there. Their research doesn't show any dispersion or distribution of people for quite a while. Um, and so I, and that fits with what we know from the Tower of Babel, that you have, you have creation, 
you have the flood, you have the, the repopulation of, of the, the world then after Noah, and then you have within, I forget how long after, after Noah till the uh, Tower of Babel, and then you have the dispersion of people, the rapid dispersion of people that, that many Christian scientists have, have tried to rationalize as being a normal migratory pattern of, of humans. But what we don't find are the intervening, the intermediate steps. You know, if I'm going to walk from, from Iran to South America, that's not a weak walk. That's not even a lifetime walk. That's a multi-generation walk, right? Um, to, to go across the land bridge of the uh, Alaska, Russia, and then down through America, and then down through Central America. I mean, we're talking generations to make that trip. And we don't see any intervening, inter, inter, intermediate steps for those peoples. Which to me tells me God said poof, and moved them. And that fits the timeline, I think, better. Chuck? Oh yeah, yeah. It, it's environmental mostly, uh, just like in the in the illustration of the of the dogs, you know, dogs with uh, with short hair do better in uh, in warmer climates, and dogs with long hair do better in there. There, there's a certain level of protection melanin gives you in hotter, more sunny environments that Europe, North America, and so forth don't possess and that's why why europe uh northern asia and so forth is is in northern europe and northern asia are, are pretty light-skinned because the people groups that have have resided there and intermarried there they don't have all of the capital a's and b's anymore because they they needed to be in they needed to have have cold weather environment and and the melanin is more suited for warm weather so the the people that ended up in the in the hot sunny area have more melanin because the people with less melanin died out yes that's how they that's how the human genome project actually is able to tell where where people have migrated from. So the question that, the, 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 the main point, diversity is an intentional part of God's original design. God always intended for there to be diversity. But then we have sin are the races, a wrong word, are the shades of people, the dispersion and so forth, is it all, you know, I don't want to say the dispersion because we know that is, that's Tower of Babel, is, is what we all look like the result of sin? Had not there been sin, would we all be pan tan like Adam and Eve? Yes, no, perhaps. <laughs> if, if, if we had migrated as God intended, people would perhaps naturally congregate like people with like people in those one area, and then that would foster the, the um, genetic similarity yeah. that already happened. So I'm not quite sure what my answer is there. Yeah, if, if the statement that diversity is an intentional part of God's original design is true, then yes, we would have had a diversity of skin color. Um, if, as Anne said, if we had all my, if if they had migrated like they were supposed to and filled the earth, then then there would have been dark-skinned people in Southern Africa, there would have been light-skinned people in Northern Europe, and, and because that's 
That's not a factor of sin. That's a factor of the genetic code that we have. Now, here's the question. I just want to put a real wrinkle in this. If Adam, had, Adam hadn't sinned, would there be death? You better get this one right. If Adam had not sinned, would there have been death? No. There would not have been death. So, Chuck may be more closer to being right than we think. Yeah, it really is. Because if Adam hadn't sinned, diversity was still part of the original plan, then there wouldn't be dead people, and you wouldn't have adaptation. What's the fly flaw in that ointment? <laughs> if there's, there would be so many people, we wouldn't be able to move. No. No. Maybe, I mean... Thank you. God always planned the sin. Remember before the foundation of the world, He chose us to be His and He chose Jesus to die and we celebrate His resurrection today. It's important to walk through those varying ideas so that you can get a firm understanding of what you think you really believe. Um, I, I, I appreciate the picture of the, of the various kinds of dogs coming from wolf. Kate, did you see any, any real big issues with the, with the, uh, the pictures that he gave and, and every, every dog coming from wolf? But ultimately, from from whatever the 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 big daddy canine is, yeah. Yeah, it's interesting you say that because I, I read an article just last night about wolf is not necessarily the top of the of the canine family. There is a now unknown to us original animal. Uh, that has has all the genetic code for every canine from those uh, purple and yellow fuzzy fuzzy poodles yeah to uh, to you know bulldogs that don't have a nose and, and and so forth all that genetic material is there what's that yeah same family but I, I don't know what the I don't know what the big daddy cat is. It's not a house cat. But but they're still in the same family of of cane of, of feline. That's, that's why Adam, no, that's not why Adam, that's why Noah could have, have filled the ark with, he couldn't do it with the, the, the variety of animals we have today, the, the variety of species we have today. Um, but he could, could, I'm glad you're preaching today, Brian, because it's not happening for me. He, he could fill the ark with the various kinds of, He would have to build a way bigger ark. Well, and isn't it possible that the ark that Noah built Oh, absolutely, yeah. When when they got off the ark, there were some animals that were no longer around. There were other animals that were around but are no longer around for us now. But they were all, they were not as, as speciated as we see today 
they were in that higher taxonomy, taxonomy range of family or kind, as Scripture uses the word. Sometime when you have nothing to do and you're, not, and you're really bored, read about taxonomy of animals. That's the, that's the species and kind and all those, those phylums. and Just read about that. That'll give you a, a better insight to understand what we mean by family or kind um, to make it a little easier to understand. Questions, comments? Okay, lots of things to continue if you have the book or downloaded the book uh, to, uh, to read and, and explore on there. Father, thank you for, for the way that you created the universe, the way that you created the world and the animals, and, and that you even provided for ways to protect them in the ark, and then provide so many different kinds of an, species of animals that we see today. Thank you for the blessings of who you are. Thank you most of all for Jesus, his sacrifice on our behalf. Thank you that he didn't stay in the grave, but was in the grave Friday night, Saturday, Saturday night through Sunday morning, and then came victorious out of the grave, conquering death, providing for us eternal life. Thank you that you have the legal way to, to forgive us. Thank you for the blessings you, you give us. Thank you for loving us. We love you in Jesus' name. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.